Welcome to 2024, which is so exciting to me because it means that our Earth is exactly 2,024 years old. Um, <laughs> happy birthday, Earth. So, uh, just kidding. But you might be coming into this new year with some different emotions, maybe some hope, maybe hope for some personal growth that you're looking forward to experiencing this year. Maybe this will be the year that I can make this or that change. Like for me, I know I'm looking at my life and I'm thinking maybe this will finally be the year that I will learn how to dive into a pool. I've, I've spent 30 years and I, I haven't, can't do it. So maybe this will be the year. Um, yeah, I know. I'm not joking. That's, that's for real. I don't know. It is what it is. Uh, maybe this will be the year that I will file my taxes before April 14th, you know. Or maybe you're looking at our world and you're thinking, maybe this will be the year that we get some good news. News that things might actually be okay. Some news that might give us a sense that things are headed in the right direction. Maybe you're like me and you're thinking, maybe, just maybe this will be the year that they outlaw talking at the movie theater. Or maybe you're looking ahead at this year with some apprehension. Maybe you're, you're looking at just when it comes to things politically that we can anticipate that this year is going to be a year with some stress and some tension regardless of where your stance is. Or, or maybe you're looking at this year and you're thinking, oh, I just, I'm dreading some more bad news about, you know, our environment or, or of another war or another humanitarian crisis. See, sometimes... A new year can also feel sort of like an empty bingo card full of terrible things that could happen. But friends, I believe that the most proactive thing that we can do, regardless of how you might be feeling, is to take responsibility for our own spheres of influence, for the areas of impact that we have in our lives, so that we can do what Gandhi really encouraged us to do to be the change that we want to see in the world, not just wait for the change that we want to see in the world. And so I feel pretty strongly that the most empowering context for us to do that is in community. And there's two reasons why I feel so strongly about this. The first is really to reflect a lot of what Kathleen said that we see community mirrored all throughout our natural world. That a healthy body, when we just look at our own human body, a healthy body is one where the different and diverse aspects of our body are in communication with one another, are cohesively working together. A healthy body is really a healthy internal community. And in the same sense, a healthy planet, if we look back at times in the life of our planet, in which our planet was experiencing greater health, it was because of greater biodiversity, greater cohesion among a diverse community of organisms. But the second reason that I feel so strongly about this idea of community is because our spiritual traditions point us towards community as a structure of hope. The early Christians, they talked about community in the context of the church. In Romans chapter 12, verse 4, Paul described the church as this structure of which we all can sort of see ourselves as parts of a body. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. In Buddhism, this concept of community is called Sangha. In Judaism, it's the Kahila. In Hindu, it is known as the Satsang. And Ram Das, he said this about the satsang. The satsang is within the mass culture, like little mushrooms here and there, and somebody, maybe a Christian and a Hindu and a Buddhist, come together. Doesn't matter because those are paths. They're paths to the one, but those satsangs are what the world needs. And as I say, heart to heart. That's what satsang is. There's a word that really arises for me when I think about these different aspects of community, whether it's the coherence of the physical body or the biodiversity of nature or the idea of the church in which we are all parts of a body or the idea of the satsang in which people of various faith and life experiences can come together 
as Ram Dass says, in a heart-to-heart experience. And the word that arises for me when I think about all these things is the word harmony. And now, I want to illustrate what I mean by that word with a little bit of a group exercise. Are you with me? Can I get some help? This is going to be really vulnerable for some of you, but maybe even more so for me, because if you don't participate, this is not going to work at all. So I want to illustrate what harmony means in a musical context. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to split us up into three groups. You have my right, your left, you're going to be group one. My left, your right, you're going to be group two. And the back is group three, okay? And I'm going to assign each of you a note. And I want you to sing that note. I'm going to point to you and it's your time to sing that note. Okay, I got to get this right too. Okay, so group one, let's see, your note's going to be who, who, you got it, who. All right, group two, who, group one, who, 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 okay, stop. (laughs) Group three, who, group one, who, 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 all together. You did it. Some people from within the crowd are like, we did not do it. (laughs) From here, you sounded lovely, okay? That, my friends, was an exercise in harmony. You all participated in creating different harmonies to come together, and what you made was a chord, C-H-O-R-D. You made a chord. And what a chord is, is different notes coming together to support one another and make something greater than the sum of their parts. And what I find, uh, you know, just as a fan of music, what I've found is that sometimes notes that you wouldn't even think could go together, notes that you might consider dissonant to one another, can actually create the most beautiful of chords. But the thing about what we just did and what it was and what it wasn't is that it was harmony and it was not unison. Unison is when everyone sings the exact same note. And the thing about community, friends, is community is not unison. Community is not a space where we need to all believe the same things, where we need to all agree on every aspect of the world, where we all need to look alike, or we all need to share all the same life experiences. No, I believe that community at its best is a harmony, is where diverse notes, diverse life experiences can come together to make a chord. And yet, when we look out into our world today, it doesn't sound all that pretty, right? It often, this is what I feel like our world has been sounding like lately. Are you with me? <laughs> Trombones falling over the place. You know what I mean? It's just it, things are a little crazy right now. And I actually, f- when I thought about it this week, I, I thought of really three causes, at least from my perspective, as to why there is this great dissonance in our world today. Now, of course, there are more, but these are just three that really have stood out to me. And the first is this. In our world today, we are facing an epidemic of isolation. The CDC The organization charged with dealing with epidemics and pandemics has actually recognized isolation and loneliness as a serious problem in our country that over a third of people over the age of 45 experience what they would consider loneliness. And what we can extrapolate from this statistic is that there is a large swath of our population that is not experiencing community at all, let alone real deep belonging within community. The second reason is another thing that we experience greatly in our world today is a sense of tribalism, the sense of us versus them thinking. And this way of being in the world is a lot more like that idea of unison, everyone thinking and sounding exactly alike. And now this can be really tricky because it can sometimes feel like community. And yet when we look at 
the community of politics, what we actually see is that really right now our political system doesn't have any nuance. There aren't nuanced conversations. There isn't this ability to share among different sides and different perspectives and to communicate across different lines. So what we see in our world today is actually not community, but conformity. And the third kind of pitfall that we are experiencing in our world is this sense of all these communities out there that are almost community, that things that we are participating in or, or you know, groups or social things that, you know, they, they give us certain things, but they don't fully give us that sense of deep belonging of community. And this, I think, can be even trickier because, sure, you might say, like, I get along great with my pickleball group or, you know, I feel really uh, encouraged by the people in my Golden Doodle Owners Facebook group or... You know, maybe you would say, like, I never feel more like I'm a part of something than when I'm, you know, on the stands rooting for my favorite team. Like, sports can be one of those those aspects where you almost feel like we're part of community. But, you know, I'd also question what kind of real world change can come from a community like that. Like, for example, it's Sunday, so let's just, let's just look to the NFL and see what kind of real world change we might get from the NFL. You know, and, and honestly, they've tried a little bit. They've made a little bit of attempts, but they're, they're not really going for it all the way. It's been a little kind of quiet, their attempts at some real world change. We, we could ask, you know, the NFL, like, you know, what, what are some things we need to do in our world today to fix our world? Like, NFL, what is your stance on social justice? Well, we need to advance it. Wait, what's that? We need to advance social justice. Wait, say it again. We need to advance social justice. Okay, so every time a quarterback gets to the end zone, they might see that and they might think, okay, we need to advance social justice. And that's about it. But then you might be asking them, well, what do you mean by social justice? Like, what exactly are you talking about? And they might say, well, hate. And you might say, well, what do you mean by that, NFL? What should we do about hate? And they would say, well, you need to stop hate. What's that, NFL? You need to stop hate. So it's like they... They're, you know, they're not saying, okay, that, that just bombed. I was expecting that to go way better than it did. <laughs> Sometimes you have to own your bombs. I had this in my mind. Of, yeah, anyway. <laughs> We're not looking to the NFL to really create world change because that's too small. I can't even see that if I'm in the stands, you know? Okay, anyway, moving on. <laughs> True community, friends. True community is, I believe, where the real world change happens. A place of deep belonging, a place where we can experience depth, where we can experience meaning, where we can experience authenticity, and it comes through our diversity. It comes through being able to show up as we are. And so throughout this series, I want to look at what that is, what true community is, and how is it that we get there. And I want to be clear. It's not just in this room or in this community that I believe that you can experience deep and true community and belonging. If it's your first time here today, I don't want you to in any way to think, oh, I showed up to this spiritual community and they spent the whole time talking about why you should join them. No, what I want to do in this message and what I want to do throughout this series is really expand of our idea of community so much that we can build it and implement it throughout our lives, in our friendships, in our families, in all of the different communities that we are part of, and so that we can continue to create that here in this place. For the goal that, as Francis Vaughn, the transpersonal psychologist says, as we become increasingly aware of our global interdependence as a species, we can also deepen awareness of our spiritual interconnectedness. We cannot live in total isolation. The cross-cultural communion of awakened souls may be a key to co-creating a sustainable future and living in harmony with the earth. I do want to give one more caveat before we continue. You might be thinking, Jake, haven't you spent the last year and a half talking about how the spiritual path and the hero's journey and the self-development track really is an individual path? Isn't it true that no one can walk your path for you. No one can do that work for you. And I would say, yes, absolutely that is true. Absolutely, the spiritual path is in many ways an individual path. But also when we get hyper-focused on individuality, 
We get hyper-focused on the mentality of it's all about me and I don't need anyone else. There is actually something missing. And the author M. Scott Peck, he talks about what's missing when we get on this hyper-individual track. He says of that hyper-individual path, it recognizes that we are called to individuation, power, and wholeness, but it denies entirely the other part of the human story that we can never fully get there, and that we are of necessity in our uniqueness, weak and imperfect creatures who need each other. Now again, this comes from the author M. Scott Peck. Many of you have have maybe experienced his book, uh, A Road Less Traveled, Um, but he also wrote a book called A Different Drum, which this is drawn from, and it's a book on this idea of true community. So if you're interested in some of the themes that we cover throughout this series, you are invited to check out that book and read along with us. If you're not interested in the themes that we're covering in this series, I'll see you in February. So no, I'm just kidding. Um, But I, I love what he says, that we can never fully get there without community. And I know for me, I I want to get there. I want to experience the fullness of life that is available when we can both fully live our individual path and also fully engage in community. We've all heard that phrase, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Now, Naturally, for all of us, there are going to be barriers as to why it's difficult to fully engage in and fully invest ourselves into community. And so what I want to do today is explore some of those barriers and then look deeper and beneath those barriers to see some opportunities that are available for us underneath. And the first barrier that I want to look at today is this. You might be thinking, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to really invest myself in community Because it's hard to trust that other people have my best interests at heart. It's hard to trust that this community, this group of many different people is going to get me exactly where I want to go. How many of us, when you look back at your time in school, you remember how much you hated group projects? Oh my gosh. Like you're thinking, I know I want an A and I don't trust that every single other person in this group wants an A as bad as me. So it's like, if I have to do all the work to get the A, I'm going to get the A. Maybe some of you were the bad person in the group project, and we're not going to talk about it. But here's the thing, friends. There are going to be new solutions available to us in community that are only possible when we look outside of ourselves. Peck gives this example In regards to even just a community of, say, 60 people, he says, a community of 60 can usually come up with a dozen different points of view. The resulting consensual stew composed of multiple ingredients is usually far more creative than a two-ingredient dish ever could be. In essence, different perspectives actually lead to a greater creativity that the whole becomes much more than the sum of its parts. How many of us have ever dealt with some kind of problem or issue in our life? And so what you did is you talked to various family members and friends. You kind of pulled people within your sphere, and and you got these different responses. Maybe if you were to lay them out, you would almost see these responses on a spectrum, like, some people, you know, their advice was softer. Some people had more extreme advice. But then when you put all these different pieces of advice on a spectrum, what you found is that right in the middle, there was actually some sort of balanced and healthy approach. And and what you might have found in that moment is that it was actually the differences in the responses. It was the diversity of opinions that actually contributed and were actually most helpful in getting you to a balanced middle ground. The reason I believe for that is because we are all gifted with different ways of seeing the world, with different types of intelligence. In fact, psychologist Howard Gardner, he labeled this as the different spheres of intelligence. He specifically spoke of eight. He talked about the linguistic intelligence, finding the right words to express what you mean, spatial intelligence, visualizing the world in 3D, naturalist intelligence, understanding living things and reading nature musical intelligence, which you all participated in just now, discerning sounds, their pitch, tone, rhythm, and timbre, bodily kinesthetic intelligence, 
coordinating your mind with your body, logical, mathematical, quantifying things, making hypotheses, and proving them, interpersonal intelligence, sensing people's feelings and motives, and intrapersonal intelligence, understanding yourself, what you feel, and what you want. In addition to these eight, he also hypothesized that there were three others, spiritual intelligence, existential intelligence, and moral intelligence. But it was these eight that he really focused on using kind of empirical data for his study. But if we take all 11 of those categories, we could all probably say that we aren't all of these all of the time, right? We aren't all equally gifted in all of these areas. And in fact, Gardner didn't see this as a problem. He saw this as a good thing. He said, discover your difference, the asynchrony with which you have been blessed or cursed and make the most of it. I wonder what he meant when he said make the most of it. I wonder if what he was saying is, yes, own your gifts, own the uniqueness with which you are blessed and also recognize your limitations Bring your gifts and your limitations into community and find a fullness that only can be found in that space. The second barrier that we probably are experiencing coming into community and wanting to invest in community is this. You might say, I don't want to get involved in something and get caught up in a sort of group think where I'm only allowed to think and act a particular way. Maybe this is validly so. The hesitance that many of us have with organized religion, the feeling that we are all uh, being sort of, our diversity is being squashed and made narrow. Maybe you have even labeled this as the word cult. And yet I believe that community at its most healthy is the opposite of a cult. Peck says a real community is by definition immune to mob psychology because of its encouragement of individuality, its inclusion of a variety of points of view. For a lot of us here in this community who have gone on a sort of faith journey working with, and maybe even you would say deconstructing some of the aspects of a faith that you grew up with or held for a large part of your life. We've been on this journey and, you know, I've labeled it as such. We're trying to rescue the baby from the bathwater. We're trying to figure out what is still important to us and what can we leave behind. So maybe for you, after you've deconstructed some harmful beliefs, maybe after you've become, you know, rightfully so critical of institutions, maybe you found that still beneath all of that, out of the ashes of everything that you worked through in your own journey, you still felt this desire and this draw towards community. I'd reckon that's why many of you are here today. And I'd also reckon that that's why inclusivity is such an important value of communities like ours, whether it's inclusivity of the LGBTQIA plus community or inclusivity of people of diverse spiritual backgrounds, that we saw that community is so important to us. It's so good. It can be so life-giving that it should be something that everyone has the opportunity to experience in its fullness. And not only that, but it's that type of diversity in life experience, in spiritual experience that prevents authoritarianism. It's that type of diversity that prevents mob psychology. It's that type of diversity that prevents cultish behavior. And it's that type of diversity that ensures the health of the community, just like the health of our planet is ensured by biodiversity. The third barrier, you might be saying this, I don't want to invest in a community and all we do is we kind of get stuck in our own little world. We get so hyper-focused on what's going on within the four walls of our community and we become ignorant and blind to the real world problems that are happening out there. But friends, I believe that it's in true community that we are given the most holistic view of reality. Peck says this, because a community includes members with many different points of view and the freedom to express them, it comes to appreciate the whole of a situation far better than an individual, couple, or ordinary group can. Incorporating the dark and the light, the sacred and the profane, the sorrow and the joy, the glory and the mud, its conclusions are well-rounded. Nothing is likely to be left out. 
With so many frames of reference, it approaches reality more and more closely. Realistic decisions consequently are often guaranteed in community than in any other human environment. It's our diverse perspectives. It's our diverse points of view that instead of causing us to ignore what matters most, actually leads us to a most balanced and well-rounded perspective of what is most important and also how to approach these problems. The final barrier is this. You might be thinking, you know, I'd love to be a part of a community, but I also don't want to sacrifice my own healing journey. I don't want to give time and energy to a community that I could be spending on my own personal spiritual path. But friends, I believe that it's actually in community that we experience a catalyst and a container for our own personal individual healing and personal growth. Put a human being in a truly safe space where defenses and resistances are no longer necessary and the thrust towards health is liberated. When we are safe, there is a natural tendency for us to heal and convert ourselves. See, often when I think about what we do here, when I think about Aldea, I don't think about this community as a school, as a place where we are all taught a curriculum that we are meant to go out and regurgitate out into the world and replicate. No, I think of what we do here more like a gym. Bear with me. Not everyone here is going to be a fan of that, but because I know sometimes you think of like the aggressive, like angry person at the gym, and that's not the image I want to give today. I think of what we do more like a gym, meaning... This is a space where you get to bring your journey, you get to bring the work that you are focusing on in your own life, and you will find a safe and supportive space where you will be given resources and encouragement. But make no mistake, it is your journey, it is your work that you are being empowered to do, and is the community that provides a container and resource for that. So when I look at all of these different aspects of what I would consider true community. I see that, you know, it can be implemented in so many areas of our life. It doesn't need to be just in a place like this, but you can bring this into your friendships. You can bring this into your families. You can bring this into the different communal spaces in your life. But we also probably see how many communities out there in the world today fail to live up to these standards. And yet ultimately, This message and this series is not about the communities so much as it's about us and how we are going to choose to show up to the communities in our lives. So you might be here today and you might be thinking, well, I know that I'm part of some form of true community, whether it's here at Aldea or elsewhere. Like, I know that here at Aldea, diversity is honored and cherished. I know that this is a space where I can come and do my own work and I can come and heal. But if that's the case, friends, I would just challenge you, what would it look like to engage further? What would it look like to be more vulnerable? See, a lot of times we approach community with this half-in, half-out mentality In the back of our mind, we might not even admit it to ourselves, but in the back of our mind, there's part of us that's just kind of waiting to be offended or waiting to be failed, waiting for something to tell us, ah, this is not the place for me. This isn't the the space where I want to invest. But something I want to do today and and really throughout this series is to, to say this. It's not about waiting to be offended or waiting to be failed. It's about knowing that you will be, okay? Know that you will be, and then what? That's when the real work begins. Then what? That, I believe, friends, is when we are given the opportunity to truly experience true and deep belonging. See, next week, what we're going to be talking about is that the only way forward in this path is to recognize that our diversity, our differences, our uniqueness inevitably will make us uncomfortable, inevitably will thrust us into conflict. And it's actually not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Deep belonging can only be experienced when we actually allow that to happen and we see what's on the other side. But until then, as you leave this place today, as you, as you move forward in your week, would you look around at your friends, Would you look around at your family? Would you look around at the different communities that you are a part of? And would we recognize that it's 
our differences, not our sameness, but our uniqueness that makes that harmony, that makes that chord that we so long to hear in the world.